Hello and welcome to more Nerdy Rodent Geekery. Today I'm just doing a nice easy walkthrough of a few little extras for the automatic 1111 stable diffusion interface that you might have missed. These are ones I use all the time to make a variety of interesting images, plus they can be used on any model. For this video, I'm using the newly released Absolute Reality, downloaded from Civit AI, as I'm focusing on that photorealistic style. Though, as you can see from these examples, they are reasonably far from things you'd actually find in reality. Without further ado, let's take a look at all the tools I use to create these curious aliens, breaking down the process into tiny little chunks for easy consumption. Delicious. First up is that model. If you scroll through these various example images, you'll get a fairly good impression of the image style this model creates. If you're wondering about their prompts, you can just click the little I down the bottom there and copy the generation data should you wish. For the download, I grabbed the smaller file, and you should already be aware that stable diffusion models are saved in the models stable diffusion directory, where it's got that little text, put stable diffusion checkpoints here dot text. Scrolling down, they have a few suggestions, which I have mostly followed. So use between 4.5 and 10 on the guidance scale. OK, I'm going to ignore that advice, as you'll see why in a moment. The ones in bold, however, I have done. If you want to do these as well, you'll need to head over to the settings in your automatic 11.11 web UI. Now, you might have noticed the settings page is pretty huge now. So what I tend to do is just show all pages and then control F so I can find what I am looking for. The first thing they've got suggested there is do not make that deterministic across different batch sizes. So we'll copy and paste that in there to find that setting. There it is, do not make. So I've ticked that box and then you just do the same with all the other things as well. So we've got the ETA noise. We'll find that one. There's a couple of them in there. So there I've set that to 31337. And the other thing is clip skip as well. So if I do another search there for clip skip, as you can see, I have got that set to two. So just following the suggestions, disable face restore as well. It's terrible. Never use it. I completely agree. All right. What else have we got here? Use simple prompts as complex prompts may make less realistic pictures. All right. I'm going to ignore that. Use a detailer to enhance faces. I'm mostly going to ignore that as well. Use bad dream and unrealistic dream negative embeddings. OK, I am actually using these and these are pretty good. So you'll need to download these from Civit AI as well. These are textual inversions. So there you've got bad dream and also unrealistic dream as well. Those ones you'll need to save into your embeddings directory. So there it is, stable diffusion embeddings. I've got unrealistic and bad dream in there. They also suggest using high res fix with those settings there, denoise 0.45, 20 steps, and this high res upscaler. If you don't have that high res upscaler, you can also download that as well. Of course, links are down in the description and the upscaler needs to go into your models ESR GAN directory there. I have it in mine. As mentioned, the model I downloaded was the smaller FP16 one, and there is a link there which gives you an example image showing the difference between those two. There's the pruned safe tensors and there's the unpruned one. So that's the, the smaller one and the big file there. As you can see, there isn't very much difference at all. Is it worth two gig? I don't know. I didn't think it was, so that's why I downloaded the smaller one, but the choice is yours. For the extensions, I've got the optional A detailer that they suggest, along with a couple of my own favorites here, neutral prompt and also a modified version of dynamic thresholding. As usual with extensions in Automatic 11.11, these can be installed with just a couple of clicks from that extensions tab. Now, most of them are available when you do load from in there, but for the modified version of the dynamic threshold, you are going to have to install that one from URL. Another thing you might have noticed, certainly here I'm using version 1.4 of the web interface, is that apply and restart has now turned into apply and quit. So 
after you've installed your extensions, go over to installed, hit apply and quit, and then you'll need to restart your web interface. Okay, so now we've got our model, embeddings and extensions, it's time to make some things. Let's start by following those suggestions from the model page to get an idea of some of the images without the little nerdy rodent tweaks that I love so much. As you can see here, I've got a simple prompt. I'm using their embeddings as the negative prompt. I've got the suggested sampler. So basically doing everything they said on that page. I've also got a detailer enabled down here for these as well, even though I don't normally use it. But there you can see they are pretty good. To me, they look pretty photorealistic, even if it has interpreted my prompt as something to do with baking. Never mind. Those are our baseline images, and now it's time to tweak. N no, I said tweak. Thanks. Right, so first up is Composable Diffusion. Now, you might have already seen my video on how cool this is, but we've got this new version. In case you haven't seen my previous video, Composable Diffusion basically blends different prompts together, and this neutral prompt extension gives us a couple of different ways to do that. Alongside the usual AND keyword, we now get AND underscore perp, and and underscore salt, which do their blending in slightly different ways. Just like it says here, perp is for perpendicular and, and salt is for salient and. The perpendicular one is good when concepts overlap and is less forceful than the default and keyword, whereas the salient and is a little bit like the opposite of that. So whereas perp will give up really quickly, salt will fight for its dominance. If we look at these example images on the GitHub website page, you'll get the sort of general idea. Also, if you have a little scroll down here to the advanced section, you'll see that you can nest these prompts as well. I'm not going to be doing any nesting, but if you want to get really adventurous, then that is certainly something to try. Now, while these examples are pretty good, I'm just going to expand slightly on them now. Here I've got four prompts to show a baseline and the three different options for composable diffusion. So I've doubled up the prompt there, so I'm duplicating the prompt. It's exactly the same after the AND, but we've got the normal AND and perpendicular and AND salt as well. So if we scroll up to see there, so there's the original image, there's the default AND, the perpendicular and the salient one. Now, for me, this is quite a big difference that they don't actually mention on that web page. So being that these new keywords don't change that original image quite as drastically as that one, this is more sort of what I'd expect if I was blending two prompts together that were exactly the same, I'd expect to get exactly the same image out. The and perpendicular example they give is also quite interesting, uh, mostly because I'd never actually thought to use a negative weight in the positive prompt section before, so that gave me lots of ideas as to. That was pretty interesting. And they've got a number of key observations down there. Being a nerd, I of course did my own tests as well. So here I've got a number of prompts to copy sort of what they did. So I'm using a negative one. So I'm removing the person human face from each of these. I've got and, and perpendicular, and, and salient as well. Let's see if we get the same sort of results. So there's the normal person's face. There is the normal default and you get with it. There's the perpendicular and, and that is the salient and. Now, the first key observation there is the images exhibit a higher dynamic range compared to the AND images. It's fairly easy to see in their example, a little bit more difficult to see on my examples there, but they do actually have a much higher dynamic range. Like I mentioned in my original Composable Diffusion video, the more AND keywords you add, the lower you're going to need to drop that guidance scale to avoid the colors all looking burnt out and wild and vivid. While this is something you do still need to do with the new keywords, it isn't quite as much of an issue. Additionally, we have some other nerd tricks up our furry sleeves to help even more with this, but more on that in a moment. 
Observation number two here is the and images sometimes struggle to depict a castle, a challenge not encountered by the and perpendicular images. Now, I found this to be a little bit strangely worded, especially considering this was the first time I'd come across negative weights used like that. So the challenge in this example here, therefore, is for perpendicular to give up and not remove the castle, even though you asked it to. And finally there, the and images leaning more towards the purple colour. That's certainly something they do there, but in my images, I don't think it's that bad. If we scroll down and have a look at the same sort of thing for the salient keyword, again, they have the key observations there. Salt behaving more diplomatically, enhancing areas where its impact makes the most sense and aligning with high activity regions in the output and in the middle there, sort of a blend exactly between the two, 50-50 and, and perpendicular will find its way through anything not blocked by the regular prompt. Both of the keywords are great for blending images, which can be used to create some interesting outputs, such as these hybrids here. Let's have a look what's going on. So I've got the default once again at the beginning, the standard and the perpendicular, and then the salient one. As you can see there, here we've got the, the default one. That's our standard image. That's the normal and that you get with it, which is a bit of a mess. There's the perpendicular one, which obviously hasn't changed the face because the face conflicts with our prompt, whereas the salient one has gone, yeah, that's a face, I'll turn that into a rodent, no problem, Gav. Oh, okay, so that's almost covered everything on that page. But if we have a look back up at the top here, we've got this standard deviation-based classifier-free guidance rescaling, and we've got a reference to a paper there. If we have a look over at this paper, what's this? Common diffusion noise schedules and sample steps are flawed. Yes, everybody's been doing it wrong. You've been doing it wrong. So there's the flawed and corrected versions. You've got lots of technical things that you can have a look at if you're into that sort of stuff. But I like looking at the pictures. There are the pictures, stable diffusion and ours. And basically the summary of the paper is that using this, you can get a much wider range of brightnesses. If we go down to the neutral prompt section and expand it, there you will see a slider. There it is, classifier free guidance rescale. At the moment, I've got this set to 0.5. And the other thing I've done is also put the guidance scale up to nine, whereas the previous one was six. So there in that image, you can see there's a wider variety of brightnesses. There's the previous image. It's got a it's got a look to it, hasn't it? And then we've got this one. It's definitely brighter, definitely brighter. So here we can basically adjust the colors quite nicely. However, this is where that second extension comes in, that modified version of the dynamic thresholding. Why? Because this gives us an absolute boatload more options. We don't just have that one little slider bar. We've got all sorts of things. So here we can actually change the start point if you really do want it on zero or mean, as well as the variability measure there. So you can have it on the default or using the new standard variation. So basically, if you want the new behavior there, so you set 0 STD, phi 0.7, and mimic scale 1. If we go and have a quick look at the extension, there it is, enable dynamic thresholding. Okay, we'll tick that one. That has enabled it. Then we've got this guidance scale here. So we want to put that all the way down to 1. Then we want to expand the advanced options, set 0 STD, and put that one around there to 0 0.7. And then I just turn that one off and ignore it. So basically I use this to modify the guidance scale instead. Okay, so summary time. What does all this mean? How does any of all this help? Well, basically you can combine these two simple tricks to get some even more photorealistic images. Here they are, check these ones out. So, okay, compared to the original ones, there they are. What, what do you think of those ones? compared to the new ones. I like I like the new range personally. I think they look a little bit more photorealistic. So what is going on here? Well, I've used all the things. So there I'm using and perpendicular. I'm using and salt with a negative weight 
to take out this fake illustration and a boring drawing. I'm also using a negative prompt with their embeddings as well. I'm not using a detailer. So these faces are just coming straight out of that model. I'm using the high res upscaler with their suggested settings a little bit lower on the denoising strength. That dynamic thresholding I'm also using as well. So we've got everything in one there. We've got the new composable diffusion, we've got the perpendicular, we've got the salient, and we've rescaled. If we have a quick look at those side by side as well, makes it a little bit easier to see, well, which one do you prefer? So this one's, it's good, it's quite bright. But I don't know, I just, like I say, I like the range of colors in this one. There's, there's, there's something about the look and feel that just makes it a little bit more realistic than that one. We've got all these little pop marks and things in the skin as well. The skin's a little bit perfect on that one. I don't know, it just looks nice to me. And of course, do feel free to let me know which style you prefer down in those comments. Now, the other thing you can do is increase the detail on those even more as well. Yes. So if you send those over to image to image, there's one I've sent over and we scroll down here. So I've got pretty much everything else set up the same. I'm using the dynamic threshold. I've got a, a nice high classifier free guidance and all that sort of stuff. But I've also enabled the control net tile resample. There it is. Tile resample, control net weight one. So all those defaults apart from I've also set control net is more important. And then up here, I've also set resize by up to 1.5. So that gives us a, a nice upscale. So going from 1280 by 1536 up to 1920 by 2304. And if we open that up as well, we can see there in its full glory at the moment, it's showing it at about 54% scale. So that's, that's filling my screen, but I think that is a really nice output. So there you go. Now you've got a massive render with loads of nice details and a wide brightness scale. Cracking. Plus, if you want even more nerdy rodent stuff, then do check out this next video.